Good afternoon, uh, State Councillor, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear uh, colleagues. It's my uh, honor to open uh, the session on Geneva Initiative on Capacity Development in Digital Policy with uh, uh, distinguished panelists who will uh, help us to launch this initiative today. And while we are uh, discussing and we are gathering to, the, to uh, discuss next step in the uh, Geneva Initiative on Capacity Development Digital Policy, I would like just to give you one information about the context of this initiative which started uh, uh, in September, which was uh, considered to be some sort of startup initiative, strongly supported by State Councilor uh, Mr. Pierre Modet, uh, his department, federal department, and many uh, institutions and organizations in Geneva. The underlying message of the uh, startup approach was urgency uh, to address uh, some pressing issues. And there is no better coincidence than today, uh, since we just heard that the uh, European Court of Justice ruled in the famous Uber case that Uber is transportation and not information company. Therefore, uh, it will significantly influence the business model of Uber, which will have to observe all rules and regulation uh, which are related uh, to transportation and taxi companies. The underlying message is that uh, while the policy circles were discussing this issue, European Court of Justice had to rule on the request and the right to justice by, in this case, uh, Spanish entities to answer the simple question if uh, Uber is information on transportation companies. Therefore, there is a sense of urgency there is a sense of uh, uh, need to build capacity and to address these issues in as constructive and uh, as inclusive a way as it is possible. This logic inspired the Geneva Digital Talks, which were initiated by Mr. Modet on 12th of October, and which were followed by uh, four sessions, discussing among other issues also the question of the uh, role of courts and jurisdiction in digital policy, but also a question of technology and policy, economic aspect, and human rights aspect. During these two months and the fourth Geneva Digital Talks, we clearly realized that there is a need for awareness building, inclusive governance, capacity development on the level of institutions, and on the level of uh, individuals, starting from citizens. This uh, Geneva Digital Talks, our discussions, inputs from the community, Mr. Tarek Kamal, who gave the, from ICANN, who gave the idea for uh, capacity development, prepared in a way stage uh, for the launch of Geneva Initiative on Capacity Development Digital Policy, which will be uh, initiated today uh, with the first uh, 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 speech by uh, Mr. Pierre Modet, State Councilor of the State of Geneva, and later on reflections from our distinguished panelists, uh, the, starting with uh, Mr. Philip Metzger, Director General of Federal uh, uh, Office of Communication of Switzerland, uh, Karsten Geier, um, Head of Cyber Policy of Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of uh, Germany, and uh, Chairman of the UNGG in the former, last, former. former Chairman of the, okay. Uh, next to me is uh, Constance Bommel uh, Bommelaar, uh, senior, direc uh, senior Director of the Internet Society, and uh, uh, Jean-Yves Art, uh, uh, the uh, Senior Director of Microsoft. My name is Ivan Hurbali, I am Director of Diplo Foundation and the Head of Geneva Internet Platform, and I will moderate uh, this, this, uh, today's discussion in uh, as interactive way as it is possible. Mr. Modet, please. Thank you, Javan. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to present to you the Geneva Initiative and Capacity Development in Digital Policy. The Geneva Initiative we are presenting to you today is the result of the Geneva Digital Talks, which we started in October with a view to making a concrete contribution to this IGF. The Geneva Digital Talks also contributed to the discussion triggered by Brad Smith's proposal for a Geneva Digital Convention launched on last February this year. Discussions were held in the Geneva tradition, where different views can be expressed, discussed, and whenever, if, if it's possible, converged. Geneva, as you certainly know, is not only the birthplace of many global agreements, which were often negotiated in these buildings, but it's also the home, the home to so many key actors of internet governance. 
During the Geneva Digital Talks, we wanted to take stock of all the work done here every day, often behind the scenes and away from the limelight. This work, laborious and time-consuming, is handled by diplomats, employees of NGOs, representatives of civil society, academics, and the employees of private companies. In Geneva, they work together. They disagree together, try to hammer our standards and norms, look for technical as well as for human solutions. This passion work is rarely in the news, but it's essential and it's the only alternative to what uh, Giovan Corbalia labeled two days ago as a titanic moment. Indeed, we should not wait for the next titanic to sink to agree on the standardization of radio telecommunications. Because the next cyber titanic will affect an even larger number of persons than the uh, 1,500 passengers and crew members who died in 1912. As Brad Smith of Microsoft has said, if we want to increase cybersecurity, we need more cooperation between governments and the private sector. In 2004, the member states of the United Nations established the first group of government experts, the UNGG, to discuss international cybersecurity. Five groups were created until this year, and three of them produced a consensus report. The previous two reports has reaffirmed two key facts. First, that international law, including the UN Charter, applies to cyberspace, and secondly, that states should observe relevant voluntary non-binding norms and responsible state behavior in cyberspace, of which one asserts that states should refrain from attacking critical infrastructure. The UN Secretary General said that less than 20% of the member states were represented in the UNGGE process, and that more countries must be involved in such a universally important issue. From the side of the private sector, we are hearing that these declarations are a good basis, but they must be further developed and transformed into action. More needs to be done. In Switzerland, we have experience of bottom-up approaches, and we believe in the individual perspective, in this case, the end user's perspective. The Internet Governance Forum, the IGF, represents an interesting bottom-up initiative to Internet governance. We are particularly fortunate to host the Geneva Internet Platform. This platform is funded by the Swiss Confederation and assists Geneva's diplomatic, business and civil society communities in navigating a complex digital policy landscape. Over the last three years, the Geneva Internet Platform has made considerable contribution in making Geneva a global center of expertise on Internet governance. Ladies and gentlemen, I see in your presence here a confirmation of two important elements. First, your belief and trust in Geneva's abilities to serve as a platform to foster development of cyber capacities and to help find some solution for complex digital policy problems. Second, a signal of your conviction that the pressing issues related to digital policy must be given appropriate attention in an appeased and sustainable frame allowing a multi-stakeholder approach on all points of view to be expressed. With the support of the Geneva Internet Platform, together with the Swiss national authorities and representatives from other countries, the private sector, the private IT sector, the technical community, the academic and scientific community, representative of concerned NGOs, we wish to make our contribution to creating a safer Internet. By harvesting the experience and expertise in Geneva and Switzerland, the Geneva Initiative and Capacity Development in Digital Policy will contribute to Geneva's competencies available to the legal, technical, social, and political communities working on digital issues. Our goal is to contribute towards finding inclusive and sustainable digital governance solutions, to strike the right balance between a broad digital governance approach and a focused discussion on the need for a normative framework for cybersecurity and to overcome policy silos by facilitating the sharing of knowledge and experience. The human factor is still ident identified as the weakest link in the cyber policy, and we must continue to strengthen inter international knowledge and common IT sense. Together, 
with the representatives of national government, private companies, internet governance organizations, academic institutions, we wish to contribute towards building capacities of communities and countries worldwide. In Switzerland, we have recently created the Digital Switzerland Association. The membership is very diverse. Private companies, including the Switzerland's largest banks, for example, local and regional governments, the International Committee of the Red Cross, the University of Geneva, the Airport of Geneva, and all other members. The main, the main goal of Digital Switzerland is to strengthen cooperation between all its members on the digital front and ensure a stronger and future-ready nation. I see Digital Switzerland as an inspiring model for something we, we should try to achieve globally. It's a unique and functional interplay among private sector, governments, and academia. Maybe the Geneva Initiative will lead to such a global cooperation and allow us to advance in a solution-minded way. We must overcome not only the silos, but also the cyber wodu, as it was mentioned a few days ago. Cybersecurity must be discussed rationally, without fear, and with a common sense approach from bottom up. This is what Geneva and the Geneva Initiative can offer. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Modet, for an uh, inspiring uh, inaugural uh, address, which reflects also the position uh, that uh, you have in the, canton in the Geneva government of combining uh, two portfolios of security and uh, economy. And as it was clearly indicated in uh, your address, it is going to be one of the major challenges uh, of uh, bridging uh, security and economic aspects by providing future possibility and solution and at the same time addressing certain challenges as we know being the core dynamics and the core uh, challenge of uh, digital policy. Uh, I would like to inv invite uh, Mr. Philip Metzger to address us, please. Mr. the Conseil d'État, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think uh, I can safely say two days and a half into this 12th uh, Internet Governance Forum here in Geneva uh, that uh, we uh, are experiencing once again that it's really uh, this world's largest multi-stakeholder discussion platform that we have with the IGF um, on digital issues that is open to all interested parties, um, that this represents a truly unique opportunity to discuss uh, current themes and challenges uh, for participants from all over the world, from all interest groups, and that allow to form new partnerships and to launch new uh, shared initiatives. And I, I dare say it is maybe easier uh, here in Geneva than elsewhere to bring all those uh, people together, uh, to break up the silos together, to allow everyone to connect the dots, to learn from each other, and to see the bigger picture behind the uh, specialized issues uh, of their daily work. And I think that boils down to the theme of this IGF. I think we, we can say we are actually shaping our digital future, which is the goal um, of, this, of this event. And um, uh, bottom-up, multi-stakeholder approach embodied by the IGF is, in our view, the best way to develop uh, digital governance. Capacity development in all this is absolutely a key precondition for making progress in this multi-stakeholder cooperation. And that is why, also as part of our own national strategy on uh, digital issues, Switzerland supports the Geneva Internet Platform in an effort to building additional capabilities and capacities that allow all the stakeholders to shape the discussions and the decision-making on an equal footing in their respective roles. I think that is a key, a key aspect. All the stakeholders uh, on, an equal, on an equal basis. Now, capacity development has been one of the echoing issues of uh, this IGF discussion here uh, in Geneva. The tone of that discussion was already set at the opening uh, session on Monday when the president of the Swiss Confederation stressed uh, that we should modernize development assistance uh, from focusing not only on you know, primary infrastructures, building bridges and, and roads, to building some new type of also digital uh, bridges and, capa and capacities and capabilities. And capacity development, of course, is closely related to the realization of the 
uh, sustainable development goals. Without the use of digital uh, tools, technologies, uh, services, no SDGs can actually be uh, fully implemented. There are different types of capacity development, ranging from providing digital skills to building institutions. And the Geneva Initiative on Capacity Development in Digital Policy maps this wide range of capacity development very well. And I would like to focus on one aspect, which is essential uh, for sustainable digital policy and, and a digital future in the uh, internet and in the world uh, coming uh, up. It is building of institutions that can ensure sustainable policy making. A lot has already been achieved uh, by providing training, ICANN, ISOC, Diplo Foundation, summer schools uh, have already trained thousands of officials, of academics and of civil society representatives uh, in this field. And this is an excellent basis to put more emphasis uh, on building also institutional and national uh, capacities. Many countries developed and developing face a problem today to follow the very fast changing digital policy fields from dealing with infrastructure to e-commerce and cyber security. So the GIP, the Geneva Internet Platform, has already done a lot on building capacities, uh, or, as I mentioned, here in Geneva. And this uh, is now a next step on a long journey which the Geneva Initiative outlines. And this allows us uh, to go forward, and that's why uh, the Swiss Confederation welcomes very much the Geneva Ish Initiative on Capacity Development in Digital Policy, which represents uh, a new uh, phase in these ongoing activities of the Geneva Internet Platform. We do hope that this initiative will contribute to our common goal here of achieving the necessary levels of trust and confidence. I think that is a key component of any digital strategy, that we can um, create trust uh, among our societies, um, because that will be a prerequisite for reaping the benefits, the many opportunities we have in the digital space and in an ever more um, interconnected future. So thank you very much, and I look forward to a very fruitful cooperation. Thank you, Philip. We'll now uh, turn to our uh, next uh, speaker, Karsten Gehr, Head of Cyber Policy of the Federal Department of Foreign Affairs of Germany. Uh, Karsten, in, in your uh, famous uh, Trinity presentation on uh, cyber security, combining confidence building, norms development, and capacity development, capacity development plays a quite important role. How could you reflect, based on your experience from UNGG, and extensive work in the cyber field, uh, what would be your advice for the uh, Geneva Initiative and generally capacity development in this field? Thank you very much, uh, Jovan, for, for this question. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be here today. I'm not quite sure how I'd, I've earned the honor to sit at this panel, but I, I figured that if you're offered an honor, you don't turn it down. Um, um, yes, I, actually a, a number of countries are pursuing an approach where they say we need, we need rules for responsible state behavior in, uh, in cyberspace. So that, that means both uh, clarity on how to apply existing international law, but also you need um, a, a set of, of non-binding norms of responsible state behavior. You need to give some traction to those rules. So um, you want to have confidence that states will, will adhere to these, these rules. And um, you have to bring all countries into a position to engage in a, in a, a norm adhering and confidence inspiring behavior. So capacity building is actually a very important element of um, a uh, free and open and secure uh, cyberspace, which is what we, we aspire to. Um, the importance of cybersecurity capacity building has been a, an element in the discussions of all, uh, all the GGs that I'm aware of, all cyber GGs that I, I'm aware of, 
There have been five so far, um, only the 2009, 2010, 2014, 2015, uh, 2012, 2013, and 2014, 2015, GGEs have been able to reach consensus reports. And But in all of the, these reports, cyber, uh, cyber security capacity building played a, an important role. And as a matter of fact, the discussions of the 2016-2017 uh, GGE, um, which unfortunately did not yield a consensus report, those, those discussions very much were in the spirit of, of capacity building. And capacity building would have been the, the lead chapter in the report had we reached consensus on it. Um, because what the experts asked themselves throughout their deliberations was, what concrete recommendations can we give to states for engaging in, nor in rule abiding and in confidence inspiring behavior in cyberspace? What recommendations can we give to states on how to implement the recommendations on uh, cyber and international security that previous GGEs have, uh, have formulated? And it's, it's very regrettable that, that uh, in the end, um, not all experts could join the consensus on, on the draft report, so we had to report failure. If I may, uh, if I may just comment on the, the Geneva Initiative on, on Capacity Development and Digital Policy, um, that I've, I've been listening very carefully to the, the uh, to the remarks set out uh, by, by Monsieur Modet and Monsieur Metzger. Um, in, in the spirit of the importance of capacity building for cyber and international security, I believe this is a very ambitious project and a very welcome initiative. I would uh, very much recommend that the Geneva Initiative seeks a niche that sets it off clearly against um, other um, initiatives and fora that exist, such as the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, and complements the existing uh, cyber capacity building initiatives that, that are being taken forward in, by, by many organizations and, and in many venues. And I'm not going to start mentioning one of or a few of them because then I'll always uh, forget some. Um, I would also encourage you very much to try and render the initiative as, as concrete as possible. Um, you have set out in, in the brochure um, some principles, but now they need to be translated into concrete action. And that's, speaking from experience, that's going to be difficult, difficult and hard work on which I wish you good luck. I would be very, very careful on the language that, that I use. Uh, I'll give you two examples. Uh, if you introduce new language, such as, um, there's a word, uh, respect, uh, 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 humanity check. That's a new term. And as, a, as, a, as somebody who has some experience in international negotiations, new terms, new language is always difficult. So I, I would encourage you try and use uh, established language as much as possible. Uh, I think what you're meaning here is respect for internationally agreed human rights standards. So I would, uh, I would put that to you. By the same token, um, I'd be careful with, with trying to ad adjust the meaning of established terms such as a Geneva Convention. Geneva Conventions are, uh, have, a, have a very strict meaning under international law. They cover, uh, they cover international humanitarian law. Um, and, and any international lawyer to whom you say uh, Geneva Convention will immediately say, oh yeah, this is about the, the right of warfare. And I'm not sure that's what you want to cover here. So um, I'd, be, I'd be very careful, careful on, on language. Um, but but th that can be fixed. It can, can be done. And uh, I wish you good luck in this. Thank you. Thank you, Carsten, for as always very practical and concrete suggestions. Fortunately, we didn't uh, need to seek a consensus in our activities. And we have a bit more liberty than uh, negotiating the document. Therefore, we can use academic uh, and broader policy language. Uh, but uh, those, uh, those points are, are uh, highly important, and the uh, framing of discussion is important. We just noticed in analyzing the transcripts, as you can see while we are uh, discussing, uh, uh, scribes uh, which are located, I guess, in Los Angeles are basically uh, providing transcripts of our discussion. 
and we analyze after every day what was discussed during previous day with some sort of mi minor uh, simple data mining of, uh, of big data. And one of the developments, latest development, is that uh, term internet governance, which is in the name of this forum, is increasingly replaced by digital governance. Therefore, the language is extremely important, and uh, the, your points uh, about uh, framing the discussion in the right way, even in the capacity development training context, is, is, uh, is, uh, is uh, highly, highly valid, and uh, thank you for that. Now, uh, while we are uh, navigating through the complex discussions, uh, we have the sort of uh, always support by uh, um, our colleagues from um, ISOC, um, ICANN, uh, summer schools, uh, and uh, Karsten mentioned a few other initiatives uh, that are important, international telecommunication, union capacity development activities. Constance, I noticed that you made quite a few notes on the, on the document. I expect quite, in, quite a few reflections. Please, go ahead. Thank you very much, Jovan, and thank you for the invitation. I think this is a very important initiative. We have participated at the Internet Society to uh, the different uh, talks that you have organized, and we're also part of uh, the GIP uh, and uh, also a, a longtime partner of uh, Diplo Foundation and its entire team. So thank you again for the excellent work uh, that you do. Just a quick word about the Internet Society. Um, we were founded in 92 uh, by Vince Cerf, one of the fathers of the Internet, initially to be the umbrella organization of the IETF, which basically produces standards, some of the standards of the Internet. And uh, we've expanded a little bit our activities to lead now in the field of Internet uh, policy, technology, and, uh, and education, capacity building. Um, I would say that actually the the theme, I think the overarching theme of the IGF, shaping our digital future, uh, emphasizes the importance of capacity building and, and these initiatives, such as the one we're, we're launching today. Uh, so that is uh, clearly very, very positive. Um, and yes, I went through uh, the language, the different recommendations um, that are presented to, uh, to support the launch of this uh, important initiative. Um, like my colleague, I think it's, uh, it's uh, important to look at the language and make sure the framework is, uh, is clear uh, to everyone. Uh, but globally, looking at uh, what you were proposing, I thought the recommendations uh, uh, made a lot of sense and were simple, but I would say also powerful. I'll just take two that uh, particularly resonated with me. The first one being think uh, global but act local. Um, and this resonates with the United Society's mission because we have this capillarity. We have been working in the field in over 120 countries over the past 25 years through our chapters, through our individual members, through the organizational members also that constitute our multi-stakeholder um, multi membership. And I think the second one would be involve a wide range of actors. It seems very simple, but at the same time, if you think about the multi-stakeholder governance concept, it can be well constructed but at the same time, if you don't have full participation, if you don't have a vibrant ecosystem, a vibrant community participating to these dialogues, then your multi-stakeholder governance system is just theory. Hence the importance of these capacity building initiatives, all the efforts, organizations like ISOC, ICANN, many others, and of course, um, GIP and Diplo Foundation, who really I think are at the heart of um, the mission of um, clarifying and supporting internet governance dialogues. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Jean uh, uh, Art is um, um, our um, next uh, co contributor, senior director of Microsoft. And uh, Jean Yves, you, you made uh, this year quite busy for us after the Valentine's Day announcement by Mr. Brad Smith, and uh, it created a lot of, triggered a lot of discussions, a lot of debates, uh, agreement, uh, disagreements, uh, but it created definitely different stage in which we are uh, addressing uh, cybersecurity and digital policy issues. And uh, uh, that's uh, created new vibrancy in Geneva and worldwide, different views, and I'm, uh, I, I, I would like to thank uh, Microsoft, Brad Smith, and uh, you for uh, introducing the new dynamism in discussion with uh, many agreements and disagreements about it, but definitely some, uh, some fresh breeze in, uh, in the in digital policy discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jovan. 
and it's not yet over. It's just starting. <laughs> Um, look, I mean, the, the way I see this is that um, we are talking a lot here in Geneva uh, on both sides of the lake uh, about a fourth industrial revolution. And um, I think we, it's the right word. You know, we are really in the midst of something which is very, very big, a very big transformation, which is made possible by uh, the developments that we see in technology cloud computing, which has a, a, a processing power which is absolutely unequal, which is unimaginable, which enables us to do um, a number of uh, other technology developments, uh, other learnings. So cloud computing has a power which is really, we're we just touching the beginning of that power. Um, we, we, we at Microsoft are working with virtual reality tools uh, those virtual re reality tools are going to become much more available to all industries, to all players, to teachers, to students, uh, and they are going to open new possibilities again uh, in, in, the same, in the same areas, learning and uh, uh, construction, manufacturing. So uh, there too, technology is just uh, at, a, at the beginning. Um, we'll see the next advent of, uh, of computing. Uh, all this, we, we are just at the start of this um, fourth industrial, industrial revolution. And I think it's important for you to, to realize it because if we realize that we are at the start of a, a major transformation, we give ourselves the ability to manage it not to be simply reactive, you know, to react to one development here, one development there, to, to react in a, a piecemeal approach, but we have the opportunity to actually take that revolution, drive it the way we want, and manage it the way we want. But we have to realize the extent of the transformation in which we are. And then we need to know how we want to, to build, develop, and take advantage of those technology developments that I'm, I've just mentioned, cloud computing, virtual reality, uh, mixed reality, just, just to name a few. And the way I see it and the way we see it at Microsoft is that if you want to um, have a human um, and human approach to this, uh, to, to this new technology, if you want that technology to serve society and to serve uh, individuals, you need to embed a number of values in designing a framework which is going to carry that uh, the technology. You need to focus on human rights as being a key human rights, freedom of expression, privacy, um, uh, respect, freedom to vote. Um, I mean, we were seeing uh, recently um, uh, statistics about uh, the number of cases in which technology has been used uh, to um, influence the result of elections. Um, and I mean, there are studies that, are, so, so we, we need to, to rethink a little bit how we want to use the technology. It opens opportunities, it has also challenges, and the way to manage those opportunities on the one hand challenges is to be guided by human rights in the first place. I think that, that's, the first, that's the first thing. If we think about um, the, the, the way we're going with the technology, I think human rights need to be the guide. Uh, for our policymakers and technology developers. We need to have more trust in the technology. People keep talking about it. We need more privacy, we need no, more security. Hence this Im importance that we see in this project that we have to improve uh, cybersecurity in the, in the digital space. Uh, we need inclusiveness. We need to ensure access for all. This is absolutely fundamental. I mean, we, we cannot um, continue. We need to, to address the digital divide and not continue to build on it. I think we need to, to, to really take it uh, in, in our arms and try to address that and give um, as many people as possible access to, uh, to data, access to the internet. That's, that's for me a, a very important part. We need to address skills, we need to address jobs. So the task in front of, uh, as much as the technology can open the future for us, as much as technology is giving us opportunities and also challenges, our task to build the framework for that technology is going to uh, cover a number of different topics. Uh, I've just mentioned a few. I've mentioned human rights, I've mentioned job skills, I've mentioned cybersecurity, uh, I've mentioned trust. So there is, a, there is really a lot of uh, elements that we need to 
bring together, um, pull together in order to develop the best framework to enable this digital transformation, this, the, the, this technology developments that we, we just starting to touch to give us their full potential and to enable us to take advantage of the full potential of the technology. That's the task. Needless to say, given such a task, capacity building <laughs> seems to me to be a very important element. I mean, for me, capacity building is not simply focusing on cybersecurity. It is much broader than that. Capacity building is there to enable uh, all participants, uh, technology developers, policy makers, uh, academics, to have a, 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 a more holistic approach uh, to, um, to, to those technology developments. Um, and, uh, and so for me, uh, this idea of capacity building is really key, again, to help us build the um, framework, I'm not, I'm not saying regular fr framework, but, but build the, also the policy framework, which will enable us to actually control, manage, and direct the, the, the technology revolution that we are just uh, starting to, uh, to, to feel. Capacity building, it's very important for the reason that, that I have mentioned, and, and I'm speaking really here you know, in my capacity, of course I'm from Microsoft, but, and I see those developments, but that, that's how I personally see um, uh, our future. Um, here in Geneva, absolutely yes, here in Geneva. Uh, because um, uh, Geneva is the place where you have all the expertise that you need to support the capacity building. The number of UN agencies that you have here that touch upon all those aspects of technology, whether it's um, uh, you know, the, uh, the ITU, um, uh, OM, uh, the WTO, uh, the health organizations, so all those organizations are going to experience uh, the, uh, the benefits uh, of the digital transformation in their daily activities, and therefore they need to be part of the uh, development of the framework, and therefore they need also to be part of the capacity building uh, that this initiative is taking place. So that's why for me Geneva is an important place, uh, should be in the driver's seat for capacity building. It has all those UN agencies here that are going to be absolutely critical uh, for the development of, really critical for the development of that framework. Uh, and, and next to those uh, agencies, um, again, under uh, the um, uh, impulse of uh, Pierre Maudet, you have all those discussions taking place among all the other stakeholders. So it's not only within the agencies that developments are taking place, but the whole discussion uh, and the reflection in the agencies is helped, supported, echoed uh, by uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the discussion groups that, that have been created again uh, under, under the uh, the uh, impulse of um, the Conseil National. So I think that it's a, um, f for me, there is really no doubt that Geneva is the place which will be central for the development of the framework that I was um, mentioning. And because it is uh, a place which is central for the development of the framework, I think that's where the capacity building should start from and, and, sh and, and should be driven from. Thank you. Je thank you, Janine. <laughs> And we are very concrete with uh, building the new practice in the capacity. Our speakers were within the time limits. Uh, we have uh, quite a plenty of time for discussion and I'm making the following proposal. Since uh, um, uh, Mr. Modé uh, inspired very concrete discussion during the Geneva Digital Talks and Startup, uh, Karsten mentioned uh, that we should be very practical and to the point. I suggest that our discussion is based on your inputs and we will uh, acknowledge uh, your uh, intellectual in inputs and inputs will be collated as a creative commons mm -hmm. that we develop curriculum for the course that we will start in uh, February, very concrete course and immediate start. Therefore, if you can uh, frame your uh, question and suggestion preferably about the topics that you think we should uh, teach policy makers in local governments, in uh, among diplomats, in business organizations, in dealing uh, with these digital policy ch challenges, ranging from the, and, uh, as, uh, and uh, as Jean Yves mentioned, from human rights to cybersecurity, digital economy, and all of these uh, uh, subjects. Uh, uh, Karsten, you volunteer to give us the first three uh, uh, lectures or inputs or subjects for the course. Or I force you to volunteer. 
Thank you. This reminds me of the Asterix, uh, the scene in one of the Asterix cartoons um, where the centurion says, um, you two have been volunteered to meet the goal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've been, I've, been, I've been volunteered. I think, first of all, I think you probably need more than, than one course. You probably need uh, or one, more than one curriculum. You probably need a, a, a number of building, building blocks. Also, I, I very strongly agree with previous speakers' comments that cyber capacity building is far more than cyber security capacity building. Um, you have to think security when you think cyber, but um, you cannot just stop with, with, with that. Um, so for Cyber Security 101, okay, um, just the, co the, the, the course on Cyber Security 101, I think the, a good starting point would be to, 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 uh, to reach an agreement on what the current situation is, so the threat situation. Um, the best way to get, to, to get people into action is to scare them. Um, so you, 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 you try and, and get a better understanding of the threat situation, and then you say, well, but this threat can be, uh, can be addressed. Um, it's not rocket science. It's only computer science. Um, it, can be, it can be done. So what, what is it that you need to address these threats? The first is you need certain structures and processes at the national level, so within the state, to deal with the, the threats coming in. Um, and again, it's not rocket science to build those. Um, and it's, it's not even terribly complicated or expensive. Just you, know, you, know, you have to get, get your mind to it. And the third element is what rules and mechanisms for international cooperation do we need or are out there um, on addressing these threats that, uh, that, uh, that are out there. So in essence, you need three elements. You need an understanding of the threat situation. You need an understanding of the national structures and processes to address the threat situation, or in my diplomatic wording, to engage in rule abiding confidence and, and confidence inspiring behavior in cyberspace. And you need the an understanding of the international rules and mechanisms for international cooperation to have a joint response to the, uh, the threats. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten, for star starting this uh, brainstorming of a curriculum for the, for the course. And uh, I can see that uh, Constance would like to add also a few sessions or uh, weeks of discussing. You know? Go ahead. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to bounce on what uh, uh, our colleague just, uh, just shared. And thinking about how you build this uh, curriculum, which will be extremely important, um, I think it would be good to build it, bearing in mind that actually there's very little literature in uh, the field of internet governance and multi-stakeholder governance, probably because the topic is uh, quite new. Uh, but in any case, encouraging the development of uh, research in this field, I think, is critical to make sure that we actually uh, improve the methodology and make sure that multi-stakeholder processes uh, are effective not just uh, inclusive, but also uh, address uh, issues and, and find solutions. Uh, the other comment or perhaps suggestion would be to pull in some of the knowledge, uh, some of the research that exists in other disciplines. We know, for instance, that multi-stakeholder uh, capacity building uh, research literature exists uh, for instance, in the environmental field, and has also helped some of the difficult negotiations in this field to uh, reach consensus. So that's, I think, a, a, a second uh, suggestion. And finally, I would say um, that it's probably very important to address issues at an early stage. Uh, if you think about net neutrality, if you think about any kind of cybersecurity issue, there's so much passion around them uh, that multi-stakeholder processes, although they're necessary, um, will run into uh, some sort of difficulty. And, and, and the multi-stakeholder process, in essence, uh, provides value because it is uh, based on, on, ra on rationality, on the expertise of those who are allowed to participate to the conversations. So I think my last uh, suggestion would be to be smart enough to jump on issues at a very early stage before they are politicized to make sure we extract all the juice we can out of these multi-stakeholder processes. 
Thank you, Karsten. You, uh, thank you, uh, Constance. You uh, ref uh, reflected Karsten's con uh, concern and the indication that through capacity development we should uh, uh, avoid fear-driven uh, uh, governance and uh, uh, introduce more rational, more rational government, more rational reflections and proactive reflections in, in digital policy. Probably before the policy issues become um, uh, very emotional and discussion become very heated and uh, passionate as we are, we have been seeing uh, recently on quite a few issues. Uh, uh, Barbara is our remote uh, online moderator. Uh, Barbara, what's going on in online space while we are discussing it? There is quite a vibrant discussion online, in fact. Um, and I will try to quickly summarize it. Uh, there was a remark that capacity development should be comprehensive and uh, have both online and offline components. And someone proposed that it should be connected somehow to the IGF or national and regional IGFs and to serve small island development states in particular. Actually, this was mentioned by two of the participants online. Uh, and then someone asked, this sounds great, but who should fund this comprehensive capacity building program? So that was one of the questions. And in this context, there were also two other questions. The first was, it seems that there, are a lot, there is a lot of capacity from different stakeholders in Geneva to address solutions, but what is still missing in Geneva and how can actors outside of Geneva assist processes taking place in Geneva, such as the search for a digital Geneva convention? And the second is, we often talk about the need for capacity building in developing countries, but from a different angle, when talking about capacity building, whose capacity should be focused on? Is there a capacity gap in a particular st stakeholder group? Uh, or a particular sector, and um, how are target groups identified and ensured that capacity building exactly serves these people who need it? So these are the questions online. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Well, the, already the research and the document which we prepared is, uh, is based on the available capacity development uh, programs in Geneva and beyond. We mentioned quite a few uh, institutions and organizations and um, um, two organizations which are members of the this initial partnership, Uni University of Geneva and the EPFL, who are, uh, they are represented today, today here. And uh, obviously we are not starting from the, from the scratch. There are many courses, there are many, many developments and many activities. And uh, as it was uh, indicated by Karsten, we should probably identify the niche. And one niche that was identified during the Geneva talks is that currently there is a heavy focus on individual capacity development on training courses, individual courses, immersion in policy, and there is a very little focus on institutional capacity development. And institutional capacity development is the key for creating sustainable digital policies, uh, in particular in developing countries. And that's probably one of, the, one of the major challenges because it is relatively easy to organize training. We'll uh, hear now about our curriculum in making and, uh, and uh, but it is very, very challenging and difficult to develop institutional uh, dynamism and uh, sustainability in institutions worldwide. And this is probably one of the major challenges. Peter, please. Uh, Could you just introduce? Yeah, yeah, for uh, that? Here, I'll use the microphone. Uh, Chris Painter, I'm uh, formerly with the US government uh, and now uh, a commissioner on the Global Commission for the Stability of Cyberspace. Uh, I, I certainly welcome capacity building. Capacity building is a great thing. I mean, it's something that we've been promoting for some time. The one thing I would urge you to do is uh, to look at what's out there, to, to see what's already being done. For, for instance, UNIDIR has done some uh, uh, policy training. Uh, a lot of states have done training of their diplomatic corps in this area, and that's probably worth looking at. There's the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise, uh, which was launched at the uh, last, uh, the Dutch Global uh, Conference. I know there's some representatives here. And it, I think it would behoove you to make sure that, you know, in the interest of maximizing resources, there's communication with those groups. Uh, and then there's regional efforts, like the Organization for American States has been doing exactly some of the institutional capacity building, national strategies, other things. So, so you know, Rather, you know, I think this is a good effort, but it needs to have some uh, cross currents with a lot of these other efforts, uh, because I think there's a lot of good things and even good curriculums out there that you can draw on and you don't want to reinvent the wheel. Or the worst case is the same two people and some countries get trained by nine different people and you don't really reach the people you want. Sure. Thank you. Uh, that's a very, very, very timely and important point. Uh, we, uh, 
I would like to indicate just a few channels through which uh, we, uh, we will be um, accelerating this development. In Diplo, we have been doing uh, training for 25 years for diplomats, and the curriculum is quite developed. I did it more as a brainstorming exercise to, to, to uh, bring, uh, build a cu curriculum. One channel is the network of diplomatic academies. Uh, we coordinate uh, 100 diplomatic ad academies worldwide. Uh, uh, and uh, the next meeting will be in Washington, D.C. in September 2018. And uh, th one of the important channels will be to socialize, in a way, to implement uh, capacity development uh, within diplomatic academies where the situation is not so far as rosy as, uh, as, uh, as it, uh, it looks maybe from outside. There are a few attempts to train, but I would say there are maybe four or five countries that have the structured diplomatic training and uh, out of the 100 diplomatic academies. Please. Thank you. Jelena Mocevic, uh, Heritage and Innovation uh, Advisor with European Heritage Days and World Forum for Democracy. I wanted to give a comment and maybe, maybe a suggestion to the curriculum. Uh, we are talking very heavily in the IGF of these uh, important issues, security, privacy, different technologies, and multi-stakeholder approach. I think this is uh, the main definition. Uh, so my, my view is that if you have multi-stakeholder approach, currently there are two currents in this. The one that are speaking about the impact of digitization on these concepts, security, democracy, public trust. And then the other half of the stakeholders that are talking about these concepts, again, security, privacy in a digital world. So the concept and the consequences that the content are completely different when you come from these two. And in my view, if you're talking about the capacity development in digital policy, from the institutional point of view, they are still talking heavily on the impact of digitization on this concept. Private sector, on the other hand, they're talking on, the, on these concepts in a digital world. So if you're talking about the curriculum, I would go very straight to the basic and create a course where you would be able to uh, create counter narratives, kind of produce a, a glossary of these items from one approach, the digitization approach, and the other one, the digital world approach, because I think this would be very useful for the ordinary citizens to realize that there are counter uh, initiatives, and also for the institutional uh, or partners and stakeholders to realize that their perception of what they think of these concepts are is sometimes contradictory to what the private sector it is, just for these kind of context reasons. Something uh, reducing lost in translation between different policy communities, if you can Ab say. Absolutely. And when it comes to uh, introducing these concepts to the general public who do not understand some of these, this might offer a kind of alternative where they can say, oh, so these are basically the concepts where I can go and explore further. Now, we'll start the first exercise in half an hour when we have a session with Professor Adrian Perig from the ETH, who will basically uh, join the session to the uh, cybersecurity experts and communities, and uh, we will ask him to comment on the problems that we face in UNGG in different uh, fora, uh, if there are technical solutions. Because ETH in Zurich created a, a science system, which apparently provides quite a few technical solutions for uh, cybersecurity problems. And uh, at 4.30, we'll uh, start the session uh, discussing uh, interplay between technical community and uh, cyber diplomacy communities. And that will be the first exercise. But thank you for, the, for this excellent, excellent comment. Please, could you introduce yourself? Thank you very much, Gilles Fuchs. I'm a former World Economic Forum, and I'm now at the GCSP, um, founder of CyberAid. And I wanted just to humbly offer, you've talked about capacity building, about bringing communities together, but also I think we heard about bringing the world's best locally, uh, so that, you know, you mentioned as well, thinking globally and acting local. We have, uh, over the last year, worked on a concept of a cyber aid house. That's a small house that can be implemented locally. Um, and basically, that brings best of education, tailored training to SMEs, uh, as well as some offer on policy help to uh, municipalities. And I think it's all in, in one place. And I think having one place that offers that to everyone, where people can walk in, where you can have a co-working space um, multi-stakeholder based so that mayors, councillors, but also employees as well as individuals can come and share ideas. I think by bringing them physically together, we could unlock a lot of potential. Um, so, so all our thoughts I would like to offer, we have a model here as well in the Cyber Aid House, and I would be very happy to, to share it with the community. One of the, one of the first exercises in uh, concrete implementation will be mapping and uh, providing the survey and directory of all available uh, courses, and some of them were mentioned uh, already. We had uh, uh, one, uh, we are really fortunate today that we have with us 
one of the fathers of the internet, Mr. Louis Puzan, who basically invented the packet switching network long time ago. Thank you, Louis, for joining us. And later on, uh, you, may, you may give us a few advices what we should add uh, to curriculum. We continue with our brainstorming with our panelists and uh, with the great expertise here in the room. What are the other uh, subjects that we should cover? Hanane, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Hanan Bujami from Morocco. <clears throat> I think one of the topics that I, um, I would add to the curriculum uh, to train diplomats is on uh, digital free trade. Um, I think there is a lot of discussion about it. And recently in Argentina, we know that uh, you know, a large group of governments were there. And I communicated with some from um, least developed economies or countries. And they seem to need more support um, in that field, in that specific field. I think the future will be definitely um, about negotiating free trade uh, agreements in the digital world. So it would be good to add something on that. Thank you, Hanani. We have a comment from Karsten, then a question from Richard, and maybe the last comments from our panelists, and we'll wrap up this, unfortunately, short session, one, uh, only, only 60 minutes. Please. As would, as would the last comment. OK. Uh, Richard, please. Um, yeah, just to follow up on that, I, I would support that. And in, in fact, uh, perhaps we can say, uh, Jovan and I have been looking a little bit about doing something specifically on e-signature, which is a rather obscure topic. Uh, but I have some expertise, and we're finding other experts, and that may be something that we may look at in the future. And it would be relevant for SMEs uh, in particular. Uh, Karsten, your concluding uh, comment? Concluding comment. I think uh, this has been a, a very useful session um, and a lot of input reaped, and I believe you need to continue uh, building from, from below. And in this, um, one point I would like to encourage you to do is also not not just to develop the the uh, the curriculum from the point of view as to what can we offer but also from the point of view what is needed um, so bring in the the requests and the requirements of of those who you want to reach as the target audience and ask them what's interesting to them um, I think that way um, you're, you're more likely to get a more sustainable uh, effect or a more sustained effect the other point, I just want to e echo what, what uh, Chris has said. I also mentioned it in my uh, introductory remarks. Make sure that, 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 yeah, that you develop your own home flavor, um, that you set off um, your initiative against um, others, that the many others that are out there. Thank you. Needs driven and uh, specific niche and uh, specific address. Uh, Renard, would you like to make a concluding? Um, yeah, final, final comment. Uh, just, it's just wrapping uh, things that I've heard. Um, I also believe that it's, it's important to look at what is already out there and, and try to build on, on that basis. Uh, the one thing which, um, the second thing which is I think also important is to have a very holistic approach, uh, as I was mentioning in, in, in my few introductory comments, very holistic, uh, and, and I fully agree with your point of institutionalizing the capacity building so that it's not really focusing on individuals, but it's something which is sustainable. Um, the, the one uh, element which uh, I think is going to be really specific to this one is um, the ability to rely on multiple stakeholders. Uh, the fact that you know you invited me to be uh, on, on this panel, um, um, I'm not only grateful to you, but as I mentioned to you just before this panel that Microsoft would, would be absolutely delighted to support this capacity building uh, by its presence, by sharing its know-how, by uh, training people, uh, offering scholarships. Uh, so I think it's, it's very, um, this is a space um, the, the, the development of digital policy, this is a space where I think it's important to bring together the policy makers and the expertise and um, the companies that are contributing to this technology development and their technical knowledge. So bringing to, together the digital and the policy expertise and the technical knowledge I think is key to, to help in this uh, capacity building. Thank you. Philip, would you like? Very great. Very briefly, um, maybe following up on, on Chris Painter's comment on, on, on mapping and, and identifying what's already around, and when I look at the substance of what is going to be in a course, I think gap analysis would be something I would, I would highly, highly recommend because uh, I think too often we're getting caught up 
in developing something new and we haven't done a proper gap analysis uh, or something that we think is new. So that, that's for me is a, is a key point in, Needs in the curriculum. Needs and gap analysis. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Mate, please. Yes, Concluding. very briefly too. I, I strongly believe that we can offer here in Geneva a very good platform which makes sense with the, the topic of ethics. Ethics is for me, human rights is for me the, the, the final goal. And if we can help to, to find this goal with the platform, I think that we, we will uh, we'll assume uh, our role here in Geneva. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Mude, uh, for uh, your concluding remark. As I indicated in half an hour, we are starting with the first interprofessional capacity building in vivo. Therefore, you can, uh, you can join us at five o'clock, at five o'clock. And I would like to invite you to thank uh, our panelists and all of you for uh, this interesting uh, brainstorming session in developing curriculum for uh, capacity development, cybersecurity, and digital policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mude. C'est à Genève régulièrement. Oui, oui, oui. Le bureau est là. Le bureau est là. Je vous envoie. Je vous envoie. Je